Uh, last week, we were speaking about Jewish resilience and keeping a positive attitude and uh, staying emotionally stable when the world is crazy. Remember that? Okay. For those of you who weren't here, or those watching online who don't want to go back and watch part one, at least not right away. Um, I mentioned last week that there's a famous work uh, by the medieval Spanish author Miguel de Cervantes, who was the great, they call him the, the Spanish Shakespeare. He was the Shakespeare of the Spanish language. And uh, his great work, his magnum opus, was Don Quixote. Don Quixote is the protagonist of the book. Uh, Don Quixote is uh, a knight, or in his own mind, he's a knight. Um, he thinks he's fighting dragons. Really, he is fighting windmills. He thinks he's rescuing a princess. Uh, all types of... He's, he's got this fantasy life. And... Um, at any rate, so the whole question is if Don Quixote is mad, if he's absolutely crazy, or maybe he's uh, somebody we should look up to. He's an idealist, and we should be like Don Quixote. And remember last week I said the, the Broadway musical, Man of La Mancha, which was based on Don Quixote, that the big song, the hit song there, was the impossible dream, to dream the impossible dream. And that's really the whole theme of Don Quixote is that he, he dared to dream the impossible dream, and not just to dream it, but he actually believed in it. And then the whole question is, is, is he the crazy one, or, or are the naysayers the crazy ones? So I mentioned last week that it is theorized by Cervantes scholars that Cervantes may, very well may have been a crypto-Jew. Uh, we know statistically there were an overwhelming number of hidden Jews in Spain, during that era and even today. Um, and so it is possible that there was a whole Kabbalistic subtext, a Jewish subtext to Don Quixote. And that Don Quixote in some ways was sort of like the quintessential Jew. Seeing a truth that nobody else saw and being thought to be absolutely insane. Um, and I mentioned that in medieval Spanish pronunciation, that letter X was probably pronounced more like Don Quixote, not Don Quixote, like we say it. Um, so Don Quixote, I mentioned last week, Quixote is an Aramaic word for truth. In Zoharic Aramaic, it is often used to refer to truth. Um, and I mentioned that pun, which is a probable pun that uh, Cervantes put into Don Quixote or Don Quixote. I forgot to say something. I forgot to say last week that it's a double pun. It's a double pun. Don Quixote is Don, a knight or a sir, a squire. Quixote. Because he is a fool. A shote is a fool. He, because Shota, he's a fool. In other words, he sees the Kshot, the truth, Ki Shota, because he is what the world considers to be a fool. In other words, if you're the only one in the world who sees the truth, then for all practical purposes, you're insane. And that's really the dilemma, isn't it? Is it easier to go along with the madness that is quote-unquote, conventional wisdom and be considered normal but know you're living a lie or to stand for the truth and everyone's going to think you're crazy? It's a good question. And that's really what Don, Don Quixote is about. In the 60s, when they made, made that musical, I told you everyone involved in that musical was Jewish. And obviously that was the zeitgeist of the 60s, being a nonconformist, an iconoclast, fighting convention, fighting norms, questioning norms. That's what the, the hippie movement was about. But there's also something very timelessly Jewish about it, about the whole world sees it like this, and I'm the only one who sees it like that, 
And am I the crazy one or, or are they? That's Don Quixote, the knight who is a fool, or at least what the world thinks of as a fool. So I forgot to tell you that last week, but that's really what I want to talk about tonight. This is going to seem completely um, off topic, and this is a little bit of my own Quixote in me, but I'm just going to speak my truth, and hopefully you'll be able to follow it. Um, many months ago, I made a class in this very spot, in this room here, Levi Yitzchuk Library, and uh, it was a one-part class on a topic that I didn't really know a lot about, but it came up often enough in people that I speak to, and I felt like, you know what, let me just tackle it. And the topic was, I think we called it scapegoats, uh, black sheep, and cycle breakers. And it was basically about people who grow up in a home where there's a narcissistic parent. And I mentioned then, and I'll mention again, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a mental health professional. When I use any of these terms, I'm just using them colloquially. There's no clinical uh, weight behind anything I'm saying. So just, you know, take it all with a big pinch of salt. At any rate, so you, uh, someone's growing up in a home with a narcissistic parent, and that narcissistic, narcissistic parent basically can never be wrong. That's the number one rule. That's really the only rule. They can never be wrong. And being that they are human, they are inevitably wrong. But that can't really be recognized. So somebody is elected to carry the shame and the blame that the narcissistic parent refuses to admit to. And that person is the scapegoat. And I mentioned in this class that the scapegoat, rather like, the original scapegoat, the scapegoat in the Holy Temple on uh, Yom Kippur, on the Holy Day of Atonement, is chosen somewhat at random. That's how they chose the scapegoat. They had two goats, one for a sin offering, one for a scapegoat. It was pushed off a cliff. It was chosen by, by lottery, randomly. So I said, I don't really even know why one kid gets chosen, but th that kid's the bad guy or the bad girl. Uh, and then there's often another kid who's the golden child who can do no wrong. Everything they do is perfect. But then the scapegoat kid can do no right. And in fact, if the scapegoat even ever dares to do something that might be considered an accomplishment, he or she will be actually humiliated and reprimanded for daring to do something good. Because it breaks the only rule of the narcissistic home, which is, hey, you're the one who's got to carry the shame and the blame. How dare you be successful, you're threatening the stability of this whole game that we're playing, which is to pretend that the narcissistic parent is never wrong, okay? So I posted this class, and as the kids say, it blew up. I think it has 160,000 views at this point, which for a channel like Soul Words on, uh, on YouTube is a lot. It's a lot of views for, for my channel. Uh, by far more views than any other video that I've posted. And I started reading the comments. And to date, I think there's more than 1,500 comments. And the comments were incredibly raw. There was a lot of real pain and vulnerability and honesty in those comments of people saying, you just described my family, that's how I grew up, I was the scapegoat. And don't, by the way, don't worry, I do know what the point I'm trying to get to is, so I didn't, you may have forgotten, I didn't forget. That's why I get paid the big bucks, is to remember how to get back on track. Okay. So I got a big education from these comments. One of the things that I noticed is that People were saying, you know, I was a scapegoat, but I don't think it was so random. I think it's because I was the truth teller. And that's a term that I saw a lot. I was the truth teller. And I noticed it over and over again. People saying I was the truth teller. Okay, pause that for a minute. A few months ago, I made another video. Um, again, a topic that I didn't really feel I was an authority on, but I felt I could give a Jewish spiritual perspective on it. And that's what I try to do. That's... I think 
I'm figuring out what my role is in life. It's to take stuff that people already know about and give it the Jewish or Jewish mystical perspective. And people seem to appreciate, well, some people seem to appreciate that. Okay. So I, I did another class about neurodiversity. Basically, that Hashem made everyone's brains differently. However, among all the different ways that people's brains work, there are certain ways of brains working that are more common, certain ways that are less common. So that which is more common, we call it neurotypical. That's the way most people's brains are wired. And that's the way society runs, is to favor those people. And I'm not saying it because I have any resentment or it made my life difficult or anything like that. But actually I am, but that was my sarcasm. But um, society is geared to cater toward neurotypical people. And I totally get that and I understand it. And it makes sense to me why that is the most efficient way for things to run. I get it. However, then you have neurodivergent people, people who are wired a little bit differently. And, you know, I, again, I'm not a mental health professional, so the, the letters and the initials and the clinical terms don't mean a whole lot to me, whether you want to talk, call it, you know, autism or ADD, ADHD. I don't really care. Those words don't mean a lot to me. Um, but the point is someone whose mind is wired differently. And uh, they get into a lot of trouble because, for instance... Regular people, by regular I just mean the most common way of being, um, they show each other that they care about each other by boring each other with meaningless small talk. <clears throat> when they meet each other, they'll ask weird questions that have no bearing on anything. Like, oh, when would you get to town? And then you're supposed to say, oh, uh, landed at LaGuardia at 10 a.m. Oh, Really? No, actually, it was JFK at 1 p.m. Does it make a difference to you? Does it make any difference now that you know? How's the weather? How's them sports? Whatever it is, and you're supposed to schmooze about that. Um, and that's considered, I guess, a way of recognizing people and bonding with them. Then there are people who are really, really bad at that. Neurodivergent people who can't stand the small talk. Because to them... It's, it feels so fake. It's like, why are we doing this? You want to know something you need to know? Ask me. I, I, I have nothing to hide. Just let's talk. Why are, we, why are we playing? Why are we dancing? But it goes much more than that because people don't just make small talk. People lie all the time. It is part of functioning in society is that a lot of our communication is meant to obfuscate the truth. And everyone expects you to do it. They want you to do it. They want you to lie all the time. And then you have these neurodivergent people who are like, why is everyone getting mad at me? What did I do that was so insulting? Why do I find out a year later that this guy says I'm the rudest person on the planet, right? I didn't, I wasn't trying to hurt anybody. Well, it's because you weren't playing the game that society plays where we all basically buy into certain accepted lies that are considered more appropriate. Uh, and then we just, you know, we roll with it. And everyone knows the truth, but nobody, you don't speak about it. You don't talk about it. Okay. So... Yeah. Last week, I made another video, and I said, I had an epiphany. I mentioned the video, uh, Scapegoats, uh, Black Sheep Cycle Breakers, and I spoke about that, about people with the scapegoats, and I said a lot of the comments there were people saying, that they were truth tellers, and that's why they were branded as a scapegoat, because by telling the truth, they were threatening the veneer of perfection and uh, infallibility of the narcissistic parent. And then I said, I also made a video a while back about neurodiversity and about people who are neurodivergent, that don't think typically, and the frustration that they often have dealing with the way the world is set up. A lot of the, the falseness and the, the fakeness. And I said, something happened. The penny dropped. And I put those two things together. And I said, the best way I can convey it is with a famous old story. It's famous from a Danish author named Hans Christian Andersen. But it's actually much older than that. It's called uh, The Emperor's New Clothes. 
and we're probably all familiar with the story, but I'll tell the basic point. A couple of scammers roll into town. This is all what I'm explaining on this third video. You guys following all the different videos I'm referring to? Okay. So, <laughs> these two scammers roll into town, and they decide, they hear the king is very vain, and so they decide they're going to take advantage of that. They tell him they have this cloth that only really, really refined people can see. And here's the cloth. It's a, it's a pantomime. There's no cloth. But the king doesn't want to admit that he can't see it. He has to pretend that he sees it. And in his vanity, he goes along with this and puts on a suit of clothes, which is just pretend. There's no clothes. But he goes along with it. And then they even talk him into going and parading through the streets to show everybody his new clothes. Of course, he's not wearing any clothes. He's naked. But nobody will admit it because what, what you, you're going to be the one to tell this arrogant, vain king that he's not wearing any clothes. So nobody will. So everybody's ooing and owing. Wow, what a nice, beautiful set of new clothes. And then there's this one little kid in the story. It's a kid who says, the king's not wearing any clothes. And once he pops the balloon, then everybody sort of just laughs and then the king is humiliated, and that's the end of the story. So I said, you know, it occurred to me. The little kid who says, hey, the king's not wearing any clothes. I always thought he was doing it sort of like derisively, mockingly. Sort of, uh, because the point of the story, the way I always took it was, it was social commentary about people who are fake, about society sort of covering for those in power. And so I assumed that the child was also calling out the king's nakedness in that type of spirit of sort of blowing the lid off the scandal. And then it occurred to me that perhaps this kid, I mean, he's not a real kid. He's, you know, it's, it's just a story, right? Okay. So it can be whatever we want it to be. But perhaps this kid it's actually a neurodivergent kid. And he just tells the truth. And when he says the truth, he's not trying to out anybody. He's not trying to hurt anybody. He's just saying the truth. It didn't even occur to him that this was a major faux pas, to say the least. The king's not wearing any clothes. No big deal. Like, we're all imperfect, okay? So you're not wearing clothes, and I got this problem, you got that problem. He doesn't realize what he just did was he humiliated the king in the worst possible way. So I said, I think it's possible that these uh, scapegoats are neurodivergent kids who don't know how to lie even to survive. They don't know how to intuitively go along with the agreed upon lies even when not to do so severely threatens their safety and security. And they tell the truth not to undermine the narcissistic parent. I mentioned also, I have a, it occurred to me, see, narcissists tell the truth, uncomfortable truths, and neurodivergent people also tell uncomfortable truths. You know the difference? The narcissist tells uncomfortable truths that make you squirm, and the whole point of it is to make you squirm. He knows it'll make you squirm. In fact, if a narcissist is faking being nice to you, they are gathering KGB information on you that they will use later to humiliate you. And then when they do, they'll say, it's just the truth. So the narcissist will say the truth to make you squirm. The neurodivergent person will tell you the truth to make you squirm and not even realize that he offended you. And he'll only find out a year later when somebody says, that was so rude. And he feels terrible. The narcissist won't feel terrible. The narcissist will be thrilled about the power play. He puts somebody in their place. The neurodivergent person hears that and they say, I can't believe I did that. I'm always hurting people. I hate that. And there's a lot of guilt and there's a lot of shame and resentment. Why did I hurt this person? I wasn't trying to hurt anybody. I just, okay, I'll be quiet. Every time I open my mouth, I'm hurting people's feelings. I didn't even know what I was doing. Okay. 
So I said, I think I got a little theory that that might be what's going on in a lot of cases. Let me know in the comments if you relate to this. So that was like a week ago. And hundreds of comments came in from people saying, that's my story. I was diagnosed with autism in my 40s. And uh, I found out now that the reason I was the way that I was is because I'm not neurotypical. And I couldn't stand small talk and I couldn't stand white lies. And even till today, I can't do it even to, to save my life. Yeah, totally. You nailed it. This makes everything make sense. Hundreds of comments. You told my story. Okay. Amazing. Uh, now, I'm not claiming my Nobel Prize just yet because I'm sure there were many people who said they didn't relate at all and maybe they just didn't comment. But there were enough people who related to it that there's something going on. Okay. Are you guys still following? You want your money back? You're okay? Okay. So I got an email last week, right after last week's class, from a woman who lives in Efrat, in Eretz And she gave me permission to share this. I didn't ask specifically if I could share her name, so I will not say her name. She is a therapist a mental health professional in Efrat. And she reached out to me and she said, Dear Rabbi Taub, I came across your recent video today entitled Neurodivergence and Truth Tellers. That's that video that I was describing to you a minute ago. I'm not going to read to you the whole email. It's a few pages long. I have always wondered why anti-Semitism is so rampant in the world. But this question has only intensified over the past two weeks since Hamas's horrific massacre on Simchas Torah. It plagued me and disturbed me how so many members of the international community found ways to intellectualize how Israel was really at fault for these attacks. And she gives certain examples, which I won't read. Just yesterday, I brought it up again to my husband. I won't say his name who is totally exhausted physically and emotionally since this war begun. He's been working full-time and volunteering for night patrols here in Efrat and digging graves as a member of the Hevra Kadisha. So she describes the conversation that she's having with her husband. And basically he says, well, what do you expect? This is is the way of the world, anti-Semitism. And... She says, but why do they hate us so much, I repeated. I can't wrap my head around this. I'm a psychologist, and I need human behavior to make sense. This doesn't make sense to me. We're good people. We enhance society. We invent things that enhance human life. We don't commit crime. We stay out of trouble for the most part. We give endless amounts of charity, exhibit kindness all over the world. Why on earth are we so hated? And then I saw your video today. It hit me. We are the scapegoat for the rest of the narcissistic world. We remind the world of their flaws. Like our forefather Avraham, we are neurodivergent. Mi aver hanahar. From the other side of the river. Avraham ha'ivri. Ivri is often translated as the Hebrew, which is a proper noun, which doesn't really mean anything. But it's also a common noun, which has meaning. And in fact, the Medrash discusses various meanings that it might have. One meaning is perhaps it means that he is descended from Aver, as in Shem the Aver, the son and grandson of Noach, of Noah. So Ivri might be referring to his his lineage. But also, there's an explanation that it means avar. Avar means past. Why? Because after the dispersion, after the Tower of Babel and the dispersion of all people, that's when languages began. But Avraham was speaking Hebrew, which is the language of creation, 
was the language they spoke in the Garden of Eden. So he spoke the old language, the Avar, the past language, when all the other languages were coming out new. And then there's the explanation that Ivri is from that word Aver, which means to cross over, that he came to the land of Canaan, and he was from the other side of the river. He came from Mesopotamia, and he had to cross the river in order to get to Canaan. But homiletically, what does it mean? It means that Avraham was standing on one side of truth, and the entire world was standing on the other side. Or as the prophet Yechezkel, Ezekiel, says, Echod hoya Avraham. Abraham was one person. What does it mean he was one person? He was the only guy in the world who thought like he did. He wasn't in the minority. He was the entirety of his minority. Want to talk about neurodivergent? That's pretty neurodivergent. He doesn't even have a diagnosis because no one else in the world has what he has. What's the old joke about the guy who goes to the hospital? The doctor says, I have good news and bad news. What do you want to hear first? He says, uh, the good news. He says, the good news, they're going to name the disease after you. <laughs> and they did. They named the disease after Avram. Now, I don't know if it's a disease. The world may see it as a disease because if you think differently than the world, I guess you're the crazy one. But what if the whole world is deluded and you're the only one who knows the truth? And I know every crazy person thinks they're the only one who knows the truth. But what if you really are the only person who knows the truth? Avram was the only person who knew the truth. He was the only person who knew the truth. And he was very lonely. He was completely alone. The entire world saw reality one way. He was the only one who saw it his way. He believed in one God, and not just in monotheism, that there's one God, but he believed that there is one true existence, that God is not just God of the world, but the world is one with God. There is no other existence than God. In other words, he identified the unifying theory of everything, like the physicists call it. You know this prevailing theory. There's a theory about a theory. There's a theory that such a theory exists. The unifying field theory, it's called sometimes, or the unifying theory of everything. It's basically the, the idea that someday someone will come up with a theory that explains everything. Right now we have separate theories for different things. Like you have you know, the, 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 the weak nuclear force, the strong nuclear force, electromagnetism and gravity. But there's gotta be a unifying theory that it's one formula that explains it all. So, you know, science was on that trend in the past uh, century, you know, like Einstein saying that matter and energy are one. So that's coming closer to the oneness. But ultimately, there's got to be one theory that says it's all one. It's all one. Everything's one. And whoever comes up with this theory that everything is one, he's going to be considered or she's going to be the, considered the greatest scientist of all time. Now, Avram already came up with it. He came up with the unifying theory of everything. And the amazing thing about Avram is nobody helped him out. To the contrary, he grew up among rampant idolatry. His father sold idols. And uh, he had no chinuch, he had no upbringing. He never went to Hebrew school. Nobody taught him the truth. They taught him lies. His whole life they taught him lies. And it's not that one day God spoke to him, because how old was Avraham the first time God spoke to him? What was the first thing God told Avraham in his life? Lech lecha, get out of here. Leave. Go to the land that I will show you. How old was he then? 75. So when he figured out that there's only one, and there are different ages in the Medrash, 
that uh, it gives, but as the Rebbe explains, these were phases or stages of him solidifying this theory. Uh, and he started at three. He started at three. So imagine this. He figured it out on his own. He started as a kid figuring this out. It's not that God spoke to him. God didn't speak to him until he was 75. So it wasn't prophecy. It wasn't revelation. It was genius. Can you imagine now the mind? Imagine the mind. I want you to try to imagine this person who is so brilliant, who's so uniquely brilliant, that without any scaffolding, without any precedent, without any help, he figures out that it's all one. And how does he figure out? By making empirical observations. He looks how the sun goes down, the sun comes up, the moon comes down, the moon comes up, and he figures it out. He gathers data until he figures out that there's only one existence. Everything is one. All is one and one is all. We can't even fathom the type of unique mind that we're talking about. So no wonder he was on one side of the truth and the entire world was on the other side of the truth. He saw things that nobody could see. In fact, that was his name. His name was Avram. You know what Avram means? Avram is two words. Av, which means a father. Ram, which means high or exalted. In Kabbalah, the sphera of Chochmah is called Abba or father. Give you a little Kabbalistic uh, overview here. There are various emanations of the way the infinite interfaces with the finite for the purposes of world building. And specifically, there are ten of these emanations. And we call them the ten spheroids. The first of them is chokhmah. Chokhmah means, it's often translated as wisdom, but it means the initial flash of inventive thought or insight. Like they say, Thomas Edison, when he wanted to have an invention or an idea for an invention, used to take a nap in a rocking chair holding ball bearings with a metal bedpan on the floor. And when he would nod off, his hand would relax and the ball bearings would slip from his hand and they would clang in the metal bedpan uh, and startle him awake and then he would have a new idea for an invention. That's what they say. I don't know, maybe it's, a, it's a, an urban myth, but my point is that chokhmah means the initial inception of, aha, I got an idea. It's not developed yet. I don't know how it's going to work. It's still very, very abstract, but it's the kernel, the germ of a new thought. It's inventiveness ingenuity. So in world building also we speak about God's chokhmah, that the initial flash of an idea of, hey, let's build a world. That's called chokhmah. So chokhmah is the highest level, whether we're talking about in the way that God relates to the creation, or even if we're talking about the human psyche, which is created in God's image, the pattern of the human psyche is a mirror image of the paradigm of the way God relates to creation. So Chochmah is that initial thought. And because Chochmah is that initial thought, it's not ready to be conveyed. It's not ready to be spoken. That happens later. There, there's, there, the next phase is called Bina. And Bina is like the womb where the thought develops and becomes fleshed out so that it can become more articulated. Okay, but Chochmah is this rarefied, abstract unrelatable idea. And Avraham was originally called Avram, which is Avram, the exalted father, the exalted Chachma. In other words, we're describing a person who saw reality in such a way that nobody could relate to him. Nobody could relate to him. Crazy genius. Now, later he became Avraham. It happened actually in last week's Torah portion. He became Avraham, with a hey. 
And we know the meaning of that name. Rashi even tells us, Rashi is the most basic commentary. He says it's a neutrikan. A neutrikan is an untranslatable word. I think it's originally of Greek origin, but the rabbis use the term a lot. A neutrikan means like a contraction. We have a long word that is a contraction of different pieces of other words. So he says that Avraham is the neutrikan of Av Hamoin Goyim. The father of a multitude of nations. Av the father, Hamoin means a multitude, Goyim means nations. No, Goyim is not a pejorative term like all the people on YouTube constantly ask if it is. It just means nations. The Jewish people are also collectively as a nation referred to as a Goy, as a nation. Every nation is called a Goy, a nation. Okay, so Av Hamoin Goyim means that Avraham or Avram became Avraham and he became a world leader. Here's a question. If he became Av Hamain Gaim, a world leader, you know what a world leader means? You know what a politician is? A liar. A successful politician? A good liar. So he went from being Einstein in his laboratory in Princeton with his gray suit. Remember, Einstein had like a whole closet full of nothing but gray suits because he didn't want to have to think about what he's going to wear with his unkempt hair in his, in his uh, laboratory in Princeton with his chalkboards, he went from that to becoming this very relatable guy who knew how to like talk to the press and give a sound bite. Those are like two totally different guys. The Rebbe asks this question. He says, if Avraham is a neutrikan of Av Hamain Goyim, then really he, sh he should be called um, something like Avham. There's no Reish in Av Hamain Goyim. Reish is the Hebrew letter that makes that R sound. So why is he Avraham? The Reish is a relic from Avram. You guys following this? He was called Avram, which means exalted father, which means a wisdom that's off the charts that no one can relate to. He becomes Av Hamain Goyim, which means a man of the people who can explain things to anybody. He should have, he shouldn't have kept the Reish. The Reish is from that word Ram, which means exalted, which means he, nobody could relate to him. So why, when he became Av Hamain Goyim, is he Av Raham? It's like, a hybrid of Avram and Av Hamain Goyim, but the two things are oxymoronic. You can't be the one that nobody relates to and the one that everybody relates to. Like, you want to be the, no, the one that nobody can relate to? You want to be Avram? Great. So then go into your, 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 your lab with the chalkboards and just write your formulae, and that's it. Or you want to be Av Hamain Goyim, a man of the people? Great. So then do that. But Avraham means he was Avram, he was this un, totally unrelatable person, and at the same time, paradoxically, he was Avraham in Goyim, he was a man of the people. Actually, not the people, the peoples, which is even more perplexing. Not just a man of the people. Avraham in Goyim is plural, peoples. He was able to relate to different peoples, different backgrounds, nationalities, ethnicities. But this is the prototype. Abraham was the first Jew. Abraham is the prototype of a Jew. Abraham is the archetype of a Jew. And it's, like most Jewish things, a complete paradox. On one hand, he's Avram, this ability to perceive a truth that is unrelatable, to normal people. And therefore, he is an outcast. He is by himself, completely isolated because nobody understands him. And at the very same time, he's the opposite. He's Av Hamain Goyim. 
He's a person of the people. He finds himself at ease among many different cultures. He knows how to relate to people of all different backgrounds. That's the paradox of being a Jew. The Jewish people were charged with keeping God's truth. Now, in my experience, God can be very hard to understand. I find a lot of his deeds perplexing. Just been my experience. <sighs> Being the keeper of God's truth basically means you have to be the spokesperson for something that ultimately human beings can't relate to. Now go make that popular. And you want to know the crazy thing? We basically did. Because like Maimonides says about the utility of Christianity and Islam, he says, well, you got to give it to them. They took the Jewish concepts of monotheism and of the possibility of a messianic perfection of this world, and they made them commonplace. So it's a little bit wild, like the Jews start off and in some ways continue being total outcasts, totally different than everybody else, because God says, do me a favor and represent a truth that human beings inherently cannot relate to. And then at the same time, we become these ambassadors to the whole world and actually have this huge effect on most of civilization. You see the paradox? It, the two things sh should be mutually exclusive. By the way, it blows my mind how ubiquitous the seven-day week is. You take it for granted. There's nothing astronomical about the seven-day week. The solar year, that is astronomical. You can look in the sky, you can count 365 and a quarter days. The lunar month, you can count 29 and a fraction days. The seven-day week, there's nothing in nature that would tell you that a week is seven days. It's completely a supernatural concept, which has only Jewish origins, and yet, no matter where in the world you go to do business, everybody accepts that it's normal. That's crazy. And we all take it for granted. That's a Jewish invention that caught on. But I want to tell you something. There are a lot of Jewish inventions that caught on. Like morality. And when, when we came out with it, it wasn't so popular. Pagans didn't like those concepts. They didn't like the idea that just because you can destroy somebody doesn't mean you should. They didn't like the idea of standing up and defending the poor and the downtrodden. That was very unpopular when it came out in the ancient world. Now it's pretty much accepted. Do people realize where it came from? I mean, historically speaking, it's a fact that the origins of at least Western morality are clearly from Jewish values. And the crazy thing is, they found a way, those who appreciate Western values found a way to not give us credit. And those who don't like Western values figured out a way to give us the blame. And then there's even those who say, we're the ones undermining Western values. There are values. But this is what's frustrating about being neurodivergent in a neurotypical world. And like in the home where there's a narcissist, the foil or the nemesis of the neurodivergent person is the narcissist. Or I should really say the foil or the nemesis of the narcissist is the neurodivergent person. Neurodivergent person is not looking for enemies, but the narcissist feels very threatened. And so too we have in the world, and I really believe it's a minority of humanity, but there are people who do scapegoat the Jews and they blame the Jews for everything. And you can tell how absurd their arguments are because they literally blame the Jews for everything. Meaning, 
at the very same time, Jews are fascists and communists. We're too far left, we're too far right. Like, they find everything and the kitchen sink, and they level that at us, and the whole thing, it can't even, how can it be true? And if you press them to that, they say, well, that, that's, how, that's how devious the Jews are. They figured out how to infiltrate everything, and they're hitting us from all sides. We become the boogeyman. We become the boogeyman. And we become the scapegoat that carries the shame and the blame of a certain strain of narcissism that exists in this world. And there will come a time when the truth will finally be revealed. And those who took their shame and they transferred it onto the Jewish people because they couldn't look at their own imperfection are going to suddenly be hit with great, profound, deep self-awareness and burning shame. And they will be appalled. There is a cure for this narcissism. It's called Mashiach. And every one of those people will be appalled at themselves how they vilified the innocent Jewish people. And I'm, I'm not talking about the majority of humanity. I'm talking about certain people. I think the majority of humanity is not narcissistic and they don't inherently have it in for the Jewish people and they're not looking to blame the Jewish people. But I believe something else is happening. And anybody who understands this family dynamic I'm explaining will know this. You ever heard of the flying monkeys? Flying monkeys are from Wizard of Oz. The witch sends out the flying monkeys. They're her, uh, her, her uh, minions. So a narcissist will have flying monkeys. When a narcissist decides that they need to ruin your life, and they always do it on principle, they have to ruin your life. So they manipulate other people to hate you. And then they send forth their flying monkeys. And, and when you will talk to a narcissist flying monkey, and they'll tell you the truth about what the narcissist told them about you, you'll be shocked. They're like, really? That's what they told you I was trying to do? If I thought that about me, I would also hate me. So, unfortunately, what's happening in the world is there are people who cannot confront their own imperfection. They project all of it onto the Jewish people. And some of them are influential, and some of them are able to control the, the media narrative, which is very interesting because, ironically, that's what they always accuse the Jews of doing. I wish we controlled the media narrative. When I go on to any social media, it doesn't look like we're controlling the media narrative. But, of course, the narcissistic anti-Semite will, will tell you that we, we do. We're doing it to ourselves. You understand the pathology, how sick it is? They'll say, no, no, no. The Jews purposely put out bad press against themselves. It, it, the sickness of it. They, they'll say, well, you know what happened? The Hamas attack was an inside job. Why did the Jews let it happen? They knew they let it happen. Okay, so when we defend ourselves, you blame us. When we finally we don't protect ourselves because we're exhausted the million times. So then for that, we're also blamed. It's, it's, it's insanity. It's absolute insanity. But here's what I want to tell you. We all have permission to stop trying to explain ourselves to people who don't want to understand us. We're done with that. We're done. We're done. You know what masking is? So when a neurodivergent person has to pretend to be a normal person in order to not be a pariah. And it's exhausting. <laughs> it's also part of my theory why there's such a high incidence of addiction among neurodivergent people. Because when you carry such an allostatic load, an allostatic load means just the burden of functioning. So when you're carrying such an allostatic load of constantly feeling like you have to mask, you have to fake it, you have to, you have to pretend to be something you're not just in order to be accepted in society, it's exhausting. And then, you know, you seek self-medicating ways to take the edge off of that. But at any rate, the exhaustion of masking, the exhaustion of, I just, want to be, I just want to be understood. I don't want to be an outcast. 
I don't want to be a pariah. If, if, I, if I just be myself, they'll all misread my intentions. I don't have any bad intentions. I just want peace, love, happiness. I just want good things. Why do they think I want something wrong? What is going... You know what? It's over. For 2,000 years of Gullus, the Jewish people have been masking their neurodivergence to try not to upset the world. And we're still in Gullus. We're still in exile. Geula is coming. That's redemption. That means the messianic perfection of the world. The Jewish people have to just become comfortable with themselves and say the truth. And it may hurt some people, but trust me, we're not trying to hurt anybody. Even the people that hate us, we're not trying to hurt them. But we're going to say the truth. And we're going to say the truth about a lot of things that conventional wisdom has gotten wrong. And a lot of people are in for a newsflash. But we, the Jewish people, are going to do what we're supposed to do. No, we're not here to hurt anyone. We're not here to rule over anyone. We're not here, not here to do anything bad. We're just here to say the truth. And if the truth sounds weird, yeah, because it's God's truth. It's a little bit unrelatable. But I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We were the ones who were talking about morality when it was unpopular. Now it's popular, but you guys think that you got it all right. Just listen to us. Will you please listen to us? Will you let us explain to you what it is? Is it possible that you're getting a lot of things very wrong? Past few weeks, I've seen a lot of people on both sides quoting Malcolm X, who said that if you watch the news, they'll have you hating the good guys and rooting for the bad guys. Okay. Are you humble enough to accept that maybe, maybe everything you've thought about, about everything might be different. Maybe there's another way of looking at it. And I want to tell you what happens. According to our prophets, when the Jewish people finally can speak openly the truth, a great healing occurs in the world. There's peace and prosperity for all nations. No, we are not here just for ourselves. That's your morality. That's every other religion that says that th their version of the end times, th only their religion survives. We don't say that. We say in the end, you don't have to become Jewish. There will be plenty of righteous people who are not Jewish, and they will have a place in this perfection, in this peace. You're assuming about us what, 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 you, what you think. We don't think that. You know what's going to happen? The prophet Sephania tells us that when Mashiach comes, he says, Ki oz, that then, Epei, Hashem says, I will transform, I will turn over El Amim, the, the nations, Safa Vrura, a clear language, Likrei Chulam Beshem Echod, that they will all finally be able to call out in the name of the one God. Lo'av de Shechem Echad, and to serve him all together. You understand what that's saying? When Mashiach comes, there will be a Safa Vrura, a clear language. The nations of the world will finally understand our neurodivergent truth. Will finally be understood. The whole world will understand it. And the whole world will study the truth as the Jewish people are conveying it. And it will lead to world peace. So we have to be comfortable with who we are. We have to know that since Avraham, Echad Hoya Avram, Avram was one person against the whole world. Avram was Avram Ho Ivri. He was on the other side, Aver Me Aver. He was from the other side of the truth from the entire world. We have to be comfortable with that. And instead of diluting or diminishing our truth in order to be popular or to try to curry favor so that we can be in their good graces, which never ends up working. It's always disastrous. And a campus shliach contacted me this week and told me that his students 
for the first time in their lives, are feeling desperately alone because they are Jewish. Their whole world fell apart. He said, one by one, they come into the Chabad house crying, saying, everyone who I thought was my friend hates me. I have no one. I have nothing. My whole life, everything I thought was my life has, has in, 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 in a matter of days, has disappeared. You understand that this is happening all over the world right now? That Jewish people are waking up to the fact that their sense of normalcy that they spent a lifetime building has been yanked out from under them. But this isn't new. It's sad that it's coming as a shock and a surprise to so many Jews, but it really shouldn't come as a shock and a surprise. Bilam told us, you know who Bilam was? The, the wicked prophet who was hired by the king Balak, the Moabite king Balak hired Bilam, an evil prophet and sorcerer to curse the Jews. He tried to curse the Jews in the end, he, end, uh, he ended up saying uh, praises of the Jews. And one of the things that Bilam said about the Jews, he looked at the Jewish people when they were encamped in the wilderness, and he said, Hen om lavodod yishkoi. Behold, they are a nation that dwells alone. Uva goyim loy yishashov. And they will not be counted or reckoned among the nations. So we were told this before we even entered the land, while we were still wandering with Moses in the wilderness. Hen om lavodod yishkoi. Behold, a nation that dwells alone. So when people say, Israel is a pariah. Okay. I wouldn't expect the Jewish nation to be normal. I mean, pariah, I guess, is a bad spin on being different than everybody else. But... It's not like we have another option. You understand? We, we can either be exceptional one way or exceptional the other way. Either the whole world can love us in a special way or hate us in a special way. We're never just going to be a regular nation and regular people. So if you have that illusion and the world hasn't shattered it yet for you, I'm going to ask you to gently disabuse yourself of that notion so it doesn't get smashed in a violent way. The Jewish people are one, are unique, are different, are weird. And what we need to do now is to just be comfortable with ourselves. To say the truth, the truth means God's Torah that he gave us. We have to teach the Torah to the world. I guarantee you there are billions of good human beings who will want to learn Torah from the Jewish people. That's our only path to normalcy. Our only path to normalcy is to just lean into who we are. Stop trying to fake. Stop trying to mask. Stop trying to be accepted. Stop trying to win an argument that's, that's taking place according to their version of reality. Even if you win, you lose because you bought into their version of reality. I was asking somebody recently, you know that political compass test? Anyone who spent more than a couple minutes on the internet, I'm sure you've taken the political compass test, right? Has like the grid, the quadrants, left, right, up, down, I think authoritarian, libertarian, right, left. You know what I'm talking about? So I was, I was asking someone recently, where does Torah fit on the political compass map. What's the answer? Hmm? It doesn't. It doesn't. What's funny is I've had Jews come and explain to me eloquently where it fits. It's like, where do Jews stand on the abortion debate? Pro-choice or pro-life? You're giving me two options and neither of them are Jewish. Neither of them are Torah. That's why we got to be very careful, by the way. When there's a political party that has certain values that happen to be 
aligned in certain ways with Jewish values, don't fall for it hook, line, and sinker and think that all of your values can be described by their party's platform. It's very dangerous. When a political party or an ideology or a government happens to do something that Torah approves of, then we can applaud that. We could say, great, you got it right. But don't flip the whole paradigm and become their student. They, they need to be our students. We need to teach the truth. And so Torah does not fit anywhere in the marketplace of ideas. It's not just another idea in contemporary discourse. Torah is God's wisdom. It's off the charts. It's categorically different. It's not normal. And we're causing ourselves a great deal of dysfunction trying to make it fit. And the whole world is suffering from it. It's not just we are in exile because we don't have sovereignty, true sovereignty in our land. The whole world is in Gaulus. The whole world is suffering from, from the exile. So we need to do something compassionate for the world. We need to bring peace to the world. Not by masking and trying to be like everybody else, but by having strong belief that our message is a good message. Our message is a message of peace. Our message is a message which is positive for all humanity. Except for the crazy narcissists who are going to fight it. But, but that's their problem. But every normal human being has a place in, in the perfect peace in the messianic future that our prophets foretold. So bottom line, practically speaking, if you have access to one of these devices where you can post stuff and everybody can see it all over the whole world, I don't care if you have a million followers or you have two followers. The point is you have access, you have a mouthpiece. We never had that before. Don't get embroiled in political arguments. Like I told you, once you enter into an argument that operates under a completely different set of rules of what is real and normal and true, you already lost, even if you win, you lose. Just stay above the fray and teach Torah. And it could be something basic, a basic Torah lesson, something from the Parsha, something about an upcoming holiday. You can look up a halacha, a law in the, in the concise code of Jewish law, a, a story from, from the Torah, a Bible story, something about the patriarchs, the matriarchs. Just share Torah. And by sharing Torah, and Torah is truth, we will normalize the world. We will get the world accustomed to the language of truth. And we will get the world seeing things in a healthy way. And, and the world will thank us. Will thank us for finally being comfortable enough with ourselves to share that, to share that truth that was, that was our mission to share from, from, from the time that Avram became Avraham. Each one of us has to be an Avraham. Be an ambassador. But not by trying to be normal. Be yourself. What do you have to be afraid of? People might hate you? See, that was a joke. That was hilarious. In my mind, that was hilarious. <laughs> Nobody laughed at that. What do you have to be afraid of? People might hate you? You get the joke? It's a dark joke. People already hate you. And that doesn't sound so funny when I explain it. <laughs> People already hate you. People already assume things about you that you never even dreamed of. People attribute to you bizarre, nefarious motives that you couldn't concoct if somebody made a contest to come up with the weirdest schemes and plots. So they already hate you and misunderstand you. So what do you have to lose? Be authentic. Be yourself. It's, it's the only way we're going to have world peace. It all comes down to Jewish people being authentic and being real. And if someone's going to hear that and say, well, that's, that, I don't like that exceptionalism. Basically, you're saying that peace on earth depends on the fate of the Jews. Yes, I am saying that. I am saying, yes, but what am I saying that's so terrible? I'm saying if Jews will just be benevolent teachers and, and, and leaders and, and teach the truth that God gave us 
then the whole world will, will experience unprecedented prosperity and peace and good fortune. Like, such a, such a terrible plot. We just want good things for the world. But we can only reach it by being ourselves. Be yourself. I'm just curious. We're going to cut this out of the video. Who heard this and said, I have no clue what that guy was talking about? You're not going to admit it because you're neurotypical and it's rude to do that. It's rude. You know who's going to do that.